the ASI Air and all of its variants, the ASI Air Pro and the ASI Air Plus are really good devices. But after using this device for a couple of weeks on multiple targets, there's really some things that are holding it back and some features I'd really like to see added to this little device. Today, we're gonna go through that list. You may have seen my videos where I unbox, set up, and have my first impressions, my first raw impression about the ASI Air Plus from ZW. I'll be linking to those videos above if you haven't, but I think the gist of it is that I was very impressed. But since then, I've been using the ASI Air on several targets, and there are really some things that I wish it could do and something that I really don't like about it. So let's get to it. But first, please understand that these are my personal opinions, and uh, what you think is should be in the ASI Air might be different than from what I think. So if you have different opinions or you have things to add, feel free to go down below and leave a comment. Also, while you're at it, leave a like to tell the YouTube algorithm that this video is marginally interesting. Oh, and uh, if you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe while you're at it. If you like astrophotography, I promise you won't regret it. At number seven, I'd like to see a better polar alignment. Now, the polar alignment in the ESI Air is great. It works really quickly and it works really well, uh, although I haven't tested its uh, precision and accuracy yet. So that's yet to be, uh, to be checked. But on the surface of it, it looks really, really good. What is missing is that it is restricted to people who have a view of the celestial pole or at least are within 30 degrees of the celestial pole. It's kind of a generous area, but with all of the features that the ASI Air has, including the integrated plate solving, it would be able to fairly easily implement the three uh, three point polar align uh, algorithm that Nina uses and I believe Ecos uses something similar as well which would let you polar align away from the pole. Now the three point polar alignment has its own issues in particular it needs to track stars and RA while it's misaligned will make the algorithm kind of go crazy so you probably need to do it twice in a row but it beats not being able to polar align because if you're just able to polar align without having visibility, visibility of the pole, it's already great. And in particular, this device is really made for mobile setups. I mean, it's not made for, but it's really great for mobile setups. And you never know where you're gonna be with a, mo with a mobile setup. Uh, how, how do I know that the next time I go hiking, I'll be able to put my tent down on a, at a place where I can see the celestial pole. I have no idea. And that makes me not want to take this device with me. I want to have something else uh, because uh, with something else, I know that I'll be able to do the polar alignments quickly and easily. So that's really something that I'd like to see added in the device. Another thing I'd like to see is a good filter management system. Uh, I tried using the ASI Air with my monochrome setup, which includes a filter wheel with uh, LRGB and H-alpha, sulfur-2 and oxygen-3 filters, and I found it lacking. There are some good options there, for example, the ability to choose your um, autofocus exposure time per filter, which is good, but you cannot choose, for example, uh, how, like the dither frequency per filter, because if I'm taking exposures with my L filter, Filter. I'll be taking very short exposures and I'll be taking many of them so I'll want to dither every five every ten frames but if I'm taking exposures in H alpha for instance uh, I'll be taking longer exposures and I'll probably want to dither every one or two frames I don't have this ability right now with the ASI air that's really missing and in the same order of things we have uh, the gain settings it would be nice to be able to change my gain settings depending on the, the filter that I am using as far as I can tell it's not possible and I was mentioning that the filters you can change the uh, autofocus um, exposure lengths, which is great for narrowband filters in particular, but um, you cannot have filter offsets, what we call filter offsets, which are absolute values that basically determine how much the focus changes when you switch filters. And if you have those fo focus offsets, when you change the filter, you do not need to do another autofocus run, which is very time intensive. It takes away from your imaging time. With the ASI Air, whenever I change the filter, I'll need to autofocus again. If I had filter offsets and a routine to compute those filter offsets for me, then I'd be able to just like not refocus per filter change and concentrate on temperature, temperature changes or every 60 minutes or whatever 
uh, fits uh, the bill for me. And that's really missing. And with those features missing right now, I abandoned the idea of using an ASI Air for my monochrome setup for now. If those features are added, I might reconsider it. But as it is right now, it feels a bit lacking for uh, monochrome setups. The next topic that I have is about the sequencer. Um, it's a big topic because I, I see a lot of enhancements that I'd like to see in there. Some of them are big asks, others are fairly small and I think low-hanging fruits. One of those enhancements, something that really annoys me, is that whenever I want to make a change to a plan, or even to an auto run, as far as I remember, the ASIR asks me to reset the plan, so to put the exposures that have been taken up to now back to zero. There's probably a very good technical reason for that, but I don't like it. It's really annoying. And then I saw a comment uh, from one, one of my viewers saying like the first time they saw that, they were afraid that by actually resetting the sequence, it would delete all of their previous exposures. Of course, it doesn't do that, but for a beginner, it can be indeed quite confusing. And I really wish they would make it possible to edit the, uh, the sequence, the plan or the auto run, uh, maybe after pa pausing the current exposure or whatever, but at least not having to reset every single time. And uh, something else that I really like to see, and it's, it's almost frustrating that it's not there because all the functionality is here already, but is being able to live stack while taking, doing a plan or doing an auto run. Um, the live stack has the ability to save each of the indiv individual frames, but it's not quite the same. I'd really love to be able to like be in the middle of my plan and have a, a button that says like, hey, uh, accumulate lights or whatever. Live stack what I have up to now, just that to, to see how it looks like. That would be really cool. Um, it's missing. It, it would be probably a bit difficult to implement interface wise, but I'd love that. And also, uh, still talking about the sequencer, there's still a few things uh, that are missing. It's a bit more difficult, but I'd like to have a smarter sequencer that's aware of the altitude of each of the targets. And the ASIR is aware of that because it shows us that in the search uh, menu, for instance. So um, I'd like to be able to say like image target one until it's like uh, less than, uh, until it's like it dips below 40 degrees above the horizon, then switch to target two, for instance, right? This kind of stuff, it's more difficult, but it would be really great to have this kind of parameters. And also in a civil, similar vein, I'd like to see the ability to have a better um, imaging through the meridian kind of option. There is currently like um, a number of minutes after the meridian when you can flip. So 10 minutes after meridian. The reason would be that for certain mounts, if the mount thinks that it hasn't crossed the meridian yet, but the ASI Air thinks it does, it has passed the meridian and orders a flip, the mount says like, heck no, I'm not gonna flip, but we're beyond before the meridian and the mount doesn't flip. Uh, so having the ability to put that buffer is great. And I like to put 10 minutes after meridian because then I'm sure that everything's gonna be fine all the time. Um, but what I discovered is that the ASI Air will pause imaging exactly at the meridian and then there will be 10 minutes of imaging wasted uh, by the ASI Air because um, it doesn't want to like to hit the scope into the mount. So it would be great to be able to set meridian limits, like say I'm able to actually t track 10 degrees past the meridian. So don't worry about that and keep imaging until the actual flip. Uh, but it's not able to do that right now. It's, it's a bit too bad really. I really wish it wouldn't waste the part of the night that's really the best for the object when it is highest in the sky and the most out of all my light pollution in Tokyo. And there's another thing that one of uh, my uh, subscribers and members of the channel actually mentioned to me is the, uh, the ability to have a better file naming convention, adding, for instance, session ID, this kind of stuff, because this can be used by the weighted batch pre-processing process. Hey, sorry, that's a mouthful. Um, in PixInsight to actually separate um, calibration frames and light frames per night and, and to apply them per night. Um, so yeah, that, that would be really nice to have as well. So lots of small and sometimes significant improvements that I'd like to see in the sequence management. I'm pretty sure that a lot of other people have other requests for the sequence management. So feel free to let me know down in the comments and hopefully ZW will be watching this video. I'll definitely send them an email about that. <laughs> 
And then we come to another request, which is the uh, better guiding. The guiding in the SI Air is adequate. But I will say something shocked me the first time I, I looked into the guiding tab is to see that the default calibration step was set to 2000 milliseconds. And uh, a good calibration uh, step is easy to compute if you know the guider focal length you know the guide camera resolution, which the SI Air does know. So it should be able to give us a good calibration step. But with their default calibration step, for a lot of, uh, of setups, the calibration that's done by the, the ASI Air uh, guiding will actually have too few points to have a really good calibration. And so you'll have an approximate calibration and the guiding is not going to be optimal, except that you're not gonna be able to actually notice that this happened because it's completely hidden from you. And like, I, I feel like it's the bare minimum for, for beginners that they would have this calibration set, uh, step uh, set properly, especially since all of the parameters to set it are already known. Uh, so that was big, like, but why kind of moment for me when I saw this. And talking about guiding, another thing that I'd like to see is a direct guider. Uh, and a direct guider is basically when you want to dither without having any guide camera or guide scope. It's just uh, after the frame has finished, the, the light frame has, is done, you just tell the telescope like, hey, move a bit randomly like in this direction. And that, that performs a dither, right? And this is actually the very first feature that I added to Nina when I first started using Nina because I wanted to be able to image unguided but still dither because dithering is always important whether you are guiding or not. And as far as I could tell, you still have, when you don't have a guide camera attached, you still have access to the dither settings. But when I tested, it didn't seem to take them into account anymore. And I really wish that it would still dither, have a routine that dither in a, dithers in a random direction. My implementation in Nina is kind of smart in that it, it will try across multiple dithers to make sure that we don't get away from the center of the target. It will try to kind of like, of like dither in opposite directions, kind of, in, but still being random in each time. So there's a bit of work for a good, um, guide camera less dither but it really would help because again this is a small device this is great for portable setups but many portable setups will not have a guide scope because we don't want to bother with that especially if it's like a camera lens or something like that so yeah that would be great to have dither without a guide scope and then finally about uh, guiding like i don't know what the parameters that the that the asi air uses for min, mo min movement max movement all these kind of parameters i think it's good that we're not able to you know, to push them to change them uh, because otherwise it's no longer push here dummy and it, it really becomes actually like we're not sure what we're doing anymore but it would be great to have the ability to run something like the PhD2 guiding assistant so that the PhD2 guiding assistant could determine the best values for our setup and then just set up, set them in the background. And maybe we have the ability to revert to default values if we see it doesn't work. Uh, but that way it's still push here dummy because we're not touching the values, but the PhD2 guiding assistant will have suggested and actually set some good values for us in the background without us having to do anything. The next point I have is that I really like to see a better object search, target search, that accepts fuzzy search or common name search. Because right now, if you search for M space 33, it won't find anything. If you remove the space, it works perfectly. If you uh, search for Andromeda, it doesn't find anything. If you search for M31, it will find M31, Andromeda Galaxy. And, and that's that sounds like something that should be easy to fix and i'd really like to see that fixed because a lot of beginners they don't know the messier catalog names or ngc or ic catalog names for all of those targets so that forces them to actually go in wikipedia or whatever and find the catalog name before they can actually search it even though the common names are known by the asi air so that would be really good and and good for beginners but also in general um, because it really makes things easier. 
Also talking about searching, the images in there are great. It's great to have images, to have a preview of what's, uh, what's the target, but sometimes it feel like they're too zoomed in. It would be nice to have like a bigger image that we can tap on to see like as a broad view of what the target is, where it is located, and how we could frame around that image. And that could like work well to, um, to make that into a, guy, a, a, a framing wizard, because that would be super cool. But I feel like that's missing. Also, uh, a viewer actually mentioned that some of those images are taken by um, uh, infrared telescopes, which is probably not the best representation of the target for us, who are typically uh, visual astrophotographers, or visual spectrum astrophotographers. Next, and I alluded to this in the search, I'd like to see a framing wizard. Bonus points if it works offline. So framing and mosaics directly from within the ASI Air. There's tons of methods right now using Telescopius and I documented them in a video, which I'll put the link above somewhere. Um, and even in that video, one of them is missing. Again, thanks to one of my commenters for mentioning that, Sky Safari. Uh, but it's still like, it's clunky. It's really clunky, it kind of works, but it's really clunky and it's not well integrated. For instance, the angle of the camera is, is not obvious for us to, to get and there's also some stuff with the mosaics that can be a bit, uh, a bit difficult. Um, so framing wizard so that I know exactly which part of the tar target I'm aiming for, that would be so good. I think it's really necessary to have and it's necessary to have it offline, um, even if it means just having a, a not, like images in the middle uh, for a certain field of view and then it's just back to a normal kind of uh, uh, circle around the object representation planetarium kind of feature. Um, a bit like we see in Stellarium for instance. Uh, I really would love to see that. It, it would be really super convenient and it means that if like I'm out of network coverage and I'm still using the ASI Air, I can still frame and have peace of mind knowing that I can actually frame. And I feel like that's really missing right now talking about framing, and this is probably the most important feature for me right now. It's the pointing tolerance. Please, please, please let me set a pointing tolerance when the ASI Air auto centers the object that I have selected or the, the framing that I have selected with Telescopius, for instance, or the coordinates that I have selected. It auto centers until the center of the object is close enough to the target coordinates as the ASI Air has determined. And sometimes that's not close enough. So if you're taking the same object across multiple nights, you'll see that very often your framing is different and it's different enough that you have to do a massive crop on your image of like the bottom 10%, for instance. I was taking M33 over two nights. It's a bit ambitious from Tokyo, but whatever, over two nights. When I stacked those, like I had to crop a huge amount of the image. and. I was using the same plan, same coordinates, same everything across those two nights. That's because the pointing tolerance used by the ASI Air by default is far too generous. It means that the ASI Air will be on target after only one correction. Typically, I almost never see it do two corrections. It should give us the ability to be more conservative and say like, okay, I only want you to stop if we're within one arc minute. If the center of the frame and the coordinates that I've given you are within one arc minute, for instance, or two arc minutes, or 0.5 arc minutes, and maybe have a timeout as well, like if after five steps you're not within the user's tolerance, then okay, abandon, that's fine. But at least give it a try. And we really, really need that, that, that pointing tolerance for multi-net guiding. This is probably my biggest gripe with the ASI Air right now. It really annoys me and it really needs to be fixed and I don't think it's a difficult thing to fix all of the pieces to have that are in the ASI Air. Please, please do something. Okay, and we're getting to the last point and I think most of you have guessed what it is. I wish ZW would open the ASI Air to support other devices made by other manufacturers, especially things like the focuser, filter wheel, rotator, that kind of stuff. They already do that for mounts, mind you. They support a lot of variety of mounts because ZW doesn't make a mount right now. 
um, who knows, in the future they might, after all they've gradually entered into a number of markets. Uh, at first it was only cameras, then filter wheel came, then the EEF, the focuser came. Maybe next there will be a rotator, I wouldn't be surprised to see a rotator come on the market soon. Why not a mount? Even Sharpstar is making a, a harmonic drive mount at this stage as far as I know. So it wouldn't surprise me, what happens when they add this mount? Will they close down the ASI Air to just the ZW mount? No. Probably not because like all the other users are already, uh, all their users and their loyal users are usually already have their own mounts. So we'll have an exception where ZW restricts themselves to just their hardware or gateway cameras, gateway drugs to the hobby like DSLRs, except for mounts where they support everything for some reason. And I understand the reasons for that. As far as I can tell, there are two reasons. There's the Apple strategy, like the business reason. Basically, you catch beginning astrophotographers um, when they're young and then you lock them into your ecosystem so that they buy only ZW products going forward. Uh, that's great strategy, business-wise. I feel like it is a waste as a whole. And for instance, if there's a beginner who's just starting in the hobby and they bought an Altair camera or a QHY camera, and then they learn about the existence of the SI Air, well, too bad they can't use it. So they'll have to use Nina, which is a good thing. Nina is great. But still, it feels... Like it feels like ASI at the ZW has managed to make a really good, really easy to use tablet interface. And uh, recently at night, I woke up for no reason at 1 a.m. I looked outside, I saw it was clear and I could just use my phone to drive my whole session. I actually went to the balcony, uh, opened, opened things up, uh, started a session on the, on the play ads. It took me uh, a whole five minutes and it was awesome. It was great. I would not have done that with PC-based Nina. And that's awesome, but it's closed to ZW. And yeah, so there's the business reason. There's also support reason. Support reason that, you know, if they have queries about like, why does my QH white guide camera not work? Uh, why does my main imaging camera from Altair not work? Then they cannot really field those questions. But uh, they already do that for mounts first. And second, uh, they could uh, basically say that other manufacturers are unsupported at your own risk. A bit like Skywatcher is doing with the AZ G GTI mount, which is an alt as mount, but they released a firmware to make it work in equatorial mode, at the same time saying like, by the way, it's not gonna work for astrophotography, so don't use it for astrophotography. I mean, I, we know you will, but don't ask us about it, right? I think it, it could be similar, although it defeats probably the business purpose from ZW. But again, I mean, and, and things like the focuser, the focuser, the ZW EAF, it's, um, it's a focuser. I guess that's probably the best thing I can say about it. I mean, it's adequate, it works. But if someone has like a 6200 mm with a TAC telescope, which are super good things, they will not be wanting to use an EAF, but they might want to use something simple like the ASI Air. And, and they cannot because they're, they'll be using another focuser. And, and, <sighs> I know why they're doing that. It still makes me sad. It, it, that's it. It just makes me sad. I really wish, like they really did something awesome for the hobby and then they lock it down and I understand the reasons, but it still makes me sad. It's um, because it, it feels it could be a boon for the photography hobby as a whole. Right now it's a boon only for ZW and people who use only ZW um, equipment. And yeah, no, that just makes me sad. And uh, on this dour note, that's pretty much all that I wanted to cover in this video. Let's be happy again. <laughs> happy and dynamic because it's actually, you may have noticed, it's clear skies today. So hopefully um, I'll be able to take some, to do some good imaging, which is good. I wish you all clear skies. If you're new to the channel, welcome to the channel. Feel free to go down below and click that subscribe button. If you like astrophotography, you will not regret it. And otherwise, as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, thank you so much for the comments, for all the likes. It really helps this little tiny channel. And um, as always, don't forget, the most important thing is to look up at the stars. And I'll see you next time.